Chapter Twenty of the Hero by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On his second visit to London, James was more fortunate, for immediately he got inside his club, he found an old friend, a man named Barker, late adjutant of his regiment. Barker had a great deal to tell James of mutual acquaintance, and the pair died together, going afterwards to a music hall. James felt in better spirits than for some time past, and his good humour carried him well into the following day. In the afternoon, while he was reading paper, Barker came up to him. "'I say, old chap,' he said, "'I quite forgot to tell you yesterday. You remember Mrs. Wallace, don't you, Pritchard, of that ilk? She's in town and in a passion with you. She says she's written to you twice and you've taken no notice.' "'Really?' I thought nobody was in town now. She is. I forget why. She told me a long story, but I didn't listen, as I knew it would be mostly fibs. She's probably up to some mischief. Let's go round to her place and have tea, shall we? I hardly think I can, replied James, reddening. I've got an engagement at four. Rod, come on. She's just as stunning as ever. By God, you should have seen her in her weeds. In her weeds? What the devil do you mean? Didn't you know? P.W. was bowled over at the beginning of the war, after Colenso, I think. By God, I didn't know. I never saw. Oh, well, I didn't know till I came home. Let's stroll along, shall we? She's looking out for number two, but she wants money, so there's no danger for us. James rose mechanically, and putting on his hat, accompanied Barker all unwitting of the thunder-blow that his words had been. Mrs. Wallace was at home. James went upstairs, forgetting everything but that the woman he loved was free. Free! His heart beat so that he could scarcely breathe. He was afraid of betraying his agitation, and had to make a deliberate effort to contain himself. Mrs. Wallace gave a little cry of surprise on seeing James. She had not changed. The black gown she wore, fashionable, but slightly fantastic, set off the dazzling olive clearness of her skin and the rich colour of her hair. James turned pale with the passion that consumed him. He could hardly speak. You wretch, she cried, her eyes sparkling. I have written to you twice, once to congratulate you and then to ask you to come and see me, and you took not the least notice. Barker has just told me you wrote. I am so sorry. Oh, well, I thought you might not receive the letters. I'll forgive you. She wore Indian anklets on her wrists and a barbaric chain about her neck, so that even in the London lodging house she preserved a mysterious oriental charm. In her movements there was a sinuous feline grace which was delightful and yet rather terrifying. One fancied that she was not quite human, that some cruel animal turned into the likeness of a woman. Vague stories floated through the mind of Lamia, and the unhappy end of her lovers. The three of them began to talk, chattering of the old days in India of the war. Mrs. Wallace bemoaned her fate in having to stay in town when all smart people had left. Barker told stories. James did not know how he joined in the flippant conversation. He wondered at his self-command in saying insignificant things, in laughing heartily, when his whole soul was in a turmoil. At length the adjutant went away, and James was left alone with Mrs. Wallace. Do you wish me to go? he asked. You can turn me out if you do. Oh, I should without hesitation, she retorted, laughing. But I'm bored to death and I want you to amuse me. Strangely enough, James felt that the long absence had created no barrier between them. Thinking of Mrs. Wallace incessantly, sometimes against his will, sometimes with a fiend's delight, holding with her imaginary conversations, he felt, on the contrary, that he knew her far more intimately than he had ever done. There seemed to be a link between them as though something had passed which prevented them from ever again becoming strangers. James felt he had her confidence, and he was able to talk frankly as before, and his timidity 
he had never ventured. He treated her with the loving friendliness with which he had been used to treat the imaginary creature of his dreams. "'You haven't changed a bit,' he said, looking at her. "'Do you expect me to be haggard and wrinkled? I never let myself grow old. One only needs strength of mind to keep young indefinitely. I am surprised, because you are so exactly as I have thought of you. Have you thought of me often? The fire flashed to Jamie's eyes, and it was on his lips to break out passionately, telling her how he had lived constantly with her recollection, how she had been meat and drink to him, life and breath and soul. But he restrained himself. Sometimes, he answered, smiling. Mrs. Wallace smiled, too. I seem to remember that you vowed once to think of me always. One vows all sorts of things. He hoped she could not hear the trembling in his voice. You're a very cool friend, Jim. You're much less shy than you used to be. You were a perfect monster of bashfulness, and your conscience was a most alarming animal. It used to frighten me out of my wits. I hope you keep it now under lock and key, like the beasts in the zoo. James was telling himself that it was folly to remain, that he must go at once and never return. The recollection of Mary came back to him, in the straw hat and the soiled serge dress, sitting in the dining room with his father and mother. She had brought her knitting so as not to waste a minute, and while they talked of him, her needles clicked rapidly to and fro. Mrs. Wallace was lying in a long chair, curled up in a serpentine, characteristic attitude, Every movement wafted to him the oppressive perfume she wore. The smile on her lips, the caress of her eyes, were maddening. He loved her more even than he had imagined. His love was a fury, blind and destroying. He repeated to himself that he must fly, but the heaviness in his limbs chained him to her side. He had no will, no strength. He was a reed, bending to every word she spoke into every look. Her fascination was not human. The calm, voluptuous look of her eyes was too cruel, and she was poised like a serpent about to spring. At last, however, James was obliged to take his leave. I've stayed an unconscionable time. Have you? I've not noticed it. Did you care for him? He took her hand to say goodbye, and the pressure sent the blood racing through his veins. He remembered vividly the passionate embrace of the last farewell. He thought then that he should never see her again. And it was fate which had carried him to her feet. Oh, how he longed now to take her in his arms and to cover her soft mouth with his kisses. What are you doing this evening? she said. Nothing. Would you like to take me to the carton? You remember you promised. Oh, that is good of you of course i should like it at last he could not hide the fire in his heart and the simple words were said so vehemently that mrs wallace looked up in surprise she withdrew the hand which he was still holding very well you may fetch me at a quarter to eight after taking mrs wallace home james paced the streets for an hour in a turmoil of wild excitement they had died at the carton expensively as was her wish and then, driving to the Empire, James had taken a box. Through the evening he had scarcely known how to maintain his calm, how to prevent himself from telling her all that was in his heart. After the misery he had gone through, he snatched at happiness with eager grasp, determined to enjoy to the full every single moment of it. He threw all scruples to the wind. He was sick and tired of holding himself in. He had checked himself too long, he now, at all horses, must let himself go. Bridle and curb now were of no avail. He neither could nor would suppress his passion, though it devoured him like a raging fire. He thought his conscientiousness absurd. Why could he not, like other men, take the brief joy of life? Why could he not gather the roses without caring whether they would quickly fade? Let me eat, drink, and be merry, he cried, for tomorrow I die. It was Wednesday, and on the Saturday he had promised to return to Little Primpton. But he put aside all thought of that, 
except as an incentive to make the most of his time. He had wrestled with temptation and been overcome, and he gloried in his defeat. He would make no further effort to stifle his love. His strength had finally deserted him, and he had no will to protect himself. He would give himself over entirely to his passion, and the future might bring what it would. I'm a fool to torment myself, he cried. After all, what does anything matter but love? Mrs. Wallace was engaged for the afternoon of the next day, but she had invited him to die with her. They feed you abominably at my place, she said, but I'll do my best, and we shall be able to talk. Until then he would not live, and all sorts of wild, mad thoughts ran through his head. Is there greater fool on earth than the virtuous prick? he muttered savagely. He could not sleep, but tossed from side to side, thinking ever of the soft hands and the red lips that he so ardently wished to kiss. In the morning he sent to Half Moon Street a huge basket of flowers. It was good of you, said Mrs. Wallace, when he arrived, pointing to the roses scattered through the room. She wore three in her hair, trailing behind one ear in an exotic, charming fashion. It's only you who could think of wearing them like that. Do they make me look very barbaric? She was flattered by the admiration in his eyes. You certainly have improved since I saw you last. Now, shall we stay here or go somewhere? She asked after dinner, when they were smoking cigarettes. Let us stay here. Mrs. Wallace began talking the old nonsense which in days past had delighted James. It enchanted him to hear her say, in the tone of voice he knew so well, just those things which he had a thousand times repeated to himself. He looked at her with a happy smile, his eyes fixed upon her, taking in every movement. I don't believe you're listening to a word I'm saying, she cried at last. Why don't you answer? Go on. I like to see you talk. It's long since I've had a chance. You spoke yesterday as though you hadn't missed me much. I didn't mean it. You knew I didn't mean it. She smiled mockingly. I thought it doubtful. If it had been true, you could hardly have said anything so impolite. I've thought of you always. That's why I feel I know you so much better now. I don't change what I felt once. I feel always. I wonder what you mean by that. I mean that I love you as passionately as when last I saw you. Oh, I love you ten times more. And a girl with a bun and a strenuous look? You were engaged when I knew you last. James was silent for a moment. I'm going to be married to her on the 10th of October, he said finally, in an expressionless voice. You don't say that as if you were wildly enthusiastic. Why do you remind me? cried James. I was so happy. Oh, I hate her. Then why on earth are you marrying her? I can't help it. I must. You've brought it all back. How could you be so cruel? When I came back from the Cape, I broke the engagement off. I made her utterly miserable, and I took all the pleasure out of my poor father's life. I knew that I'd done right. I knew that unless I loved her, it was madness to marry. I felt even that it was unclean. Oh, you don't know how I've argued it all out with myself time after time. I was anxious to do right, and I felt such a cat. I can't escape from my bringing up. You can't imagine what are the chains that bind us in England. We are wrapped from our infancy in the swaddling clothes of prejudice, ignorance, and false ideas. And when we grow up, though we know they are all absurd and horrible, we can't escape from them. They've become part of our very flesh. Then I grew ill. I nearly died. And Mary nursed me devotedly. I don't know what came over me. I felt so ill and weak. I was grateful to her. The old self seized me again, and I was ashamed of what I'd done. I wanted to make them all happy. I asked her again to marry me, and she said she would. I thought I could love her, but I can't. I can't. God help me. Jamie's passion was growing uncontrollable. He walked up and down the room and then threw himself heavily on a chair. Oh, I know it was weakness. I used to pride myself on my strength of mind, but I'm weak. I'm weaker than a woman. I'm a poor reed, fascinating, uncertain, purposeless. 
I don't know my own mind. I haven't the courage to act according to my convictions. I'm afraid to give pain. They all think I'm brave, but I'm simply a pitiful coward. I feel that Mary has entrapped me, and I hate her. I know she has good qualities, heaps of them, but I can't see them. I only know that the mere touch of her hand curdles my blood. She excites absolute physical repulsion in me. I can't help it. I know it's madness to marry her, but I can't do anything else. I daren't inflict a second time the humiliation and misery upon her, or the unhappiness upon my people. Mrs. Wallace now was serious. And do you really care for anyone else? He turned savagely upon her. You know I do. You know I love you with all my heart and soul. You know I've loved you passionately from the first day I saw you. Didn't you feel, even when we were separated, that my love was inextinguishable? Didn't you feel it always with you? Oh, my dear, my dear, you must have known that death was too weak to touch my love. I tried to crush it, because neither you nor I was free. Your husband was my friend. I couldn't do anything blackguardly. I ran away from you. What a fool you must have thought me. And now I know that at last we were both free. I might have made you love me. I had my chance of happiness at last. What I longed for, cursing myself for treachery, had come to pass. But I never knew. In my weakness I surrendered my freedom. Oh God, what shall I do? He hid his face in his hands and groaned with agony. Mrs. Wallace was silent for a while. I don't know if it will be any consolation for you she said at last. You're sure to know sooner or later, and I may as well tell you now. I'm engaged to be married. What? cried James, springing up. It's not true. It's not true. Why not? Of course it's true. You can't. Oh, my dearest, be kind to me. Don't be silly. There's a good boy. You're going to be married yourself in a month, and you really can't expect me to remain single because you fancy you care for me. I shouldn't have told you. Only I thought it would make things easier for you. You never cared two straws for me. I knew that. You needn't throw it in my face. After all, I was a married woman. I wonder how much you minded when you heard your husband was lying dead on the veld. My dear boy, he wasn't. He died of fever in Durban quite comfortably in a bed. Were you sorry? Of course I was. It was extremely satisfactory, and not at all exacting. James did not know why he asked the questions. They came to his lips unbidden. He was sick at heart, angry, contemptuous. I'm going to marry a Mr. Bryant, but of course not immediately. She went on, occupied with her own thoughts and pleased to talk of them. What is he? Nothing. He's a landed proprietor, she said this with a sudden pride. James looked at her scornfully. His love all through had been mingled with contrary elements, and trying to subdue it, he had often insisted upon the woman's vulgarity and lack of taste and snobbishness. He thought bitterly now that the daughter of the Portuguese and of the riding master had done very well for herself. Really, I think you are awfully unreasonable, she said. You might make yourself pleasant. I can't, he said gravely. Let me go away. You don't know what I felt for you. In my madness I fancied that you must realise my love. I thought even that you might care for me a little in return. You're quite the nicest boy I've ever known. I like you immensely. But you like the landed proprietor better. You're very wise. He can marry you. Goodbye. I don't want you to think I'm horrid, she said, going up to him and taking his arm. It was an instinct with her to caress people and make them fond of her. After all, it's not my fault. Have I blamed you? I'm sorry. I had no right to. What are you going to do? I don't know. I can always shoot myself if things get unendurable. Thank God, that's always that refuge. Oh, I hope you won't do anything silly. It would be unlike me. James murmured, grimly. I'm so dreadfully prosaic in matter of fact. Goodbye. Mrs. Wallace was really sorry for James, and she took his hand affectionately. 
She always thought it caused so little to be amiable. We may never meet again, she said, but we shall still be friends, Jim. Are you going to say that you'll be a sister to me, as Mary told the curate? Won't you kiss me before you go? James shook his head, not trusting himself to answer. The light in his life had all gone. The ray of sunshine was hidden. The heavy clouds had closed in, and all the rest was darkness. But he tried to smile at Mrs. Wallace as he touched her hand. He hardly dared to look at her again, knowing from old experience how every incident and every detail of her person would rise tormentingly before his recollection. But at last he pulled himself together. I'm sorry I've made a fool of myself, he said quietly. I hope you'll be very happy. Please forget all I've said to you. It was only nonsense. Goodbye. I'll send you a bit of my wedding cake. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Hero by W. Somerset Mon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. James was again in Little Primpton, ill at ease and unhappy. The scene with Mrs. Wallace had broken his spirit, and he was listless now, indifferent to what happened. The world has lost its colour and the sun its light. In his quieter moments he had known that it was impossible for her to care anything about him. He understood her character fairly well, and realised that he had been only a toy, a pastime to a woman who needed admiration as the breath of her nostrils. But notwithstanding, some inner voice had whispered constantly that his love could not be altogether in vain. It seemed strong enough to travel the infinite distance to her heart and awaken at least a kindly feeling. He was humble, and wanted very little. Sometimes he had even felt sure that he was loved. The truth rent his heart, and filled it with bitterness. The woman who was his whole being had forgotten him, and the woman who loved him he hated. He tried to read, striving to forget, but his trouble overpowered him, and he could think of nothing but the future, dreadful and inevitable. The days passed slowly, monotonously, and as each night came he shuddered at the thought that time was flying. He was drifting on without hope, tortured and uncertain. Oh, I'm so weak, he cried. I'm so weak. He knew very well what he should do if he were strong of will. A firm man in his place would cut the knot brutally, a letter to Mary, a letter to his people, and flight. After all, why should he sacrifice his life for the sake of others? The catastrophe was only partly his fault. It was unreasonable that he alone should suffer. If his colonel came to hear of the circumstance and disapproving, questioned him, he could send in his papers. James was bored intensely by the dull routine of regimental life in time of peace. It was a question of performing day after day the same rather unnecessary duties, seeing the same people, listening to the same chatter, the same jokes, the same chaff, and added to the incurable dullness of the mess was the irksome feeling of being merely an overgrown schoolboy at the back and call of every incompetent and foolish senior. Life was too short to waste in such solemn, trifling, masquerading in a ridiculous costume, which had to be left at home when any work was to be done. But he was young, with the world before him. There were many careers free to the man who had no fear of death. Africa opened her dusky arms to the adventurer, ruthless and desperate. The world was so large and manifold. There was ample scope for all his longing. If there were difficulties, he could overcome them. Perils would add salt to the attempt. Freedom would be like strong wine. Ah, that was what he desired. Freedom. Freedom to feel that he was his own master that he was not enchained by the love and hate of others, 
by their ties of convention and of habit. Every bond was tedious. He had nothing to lose and everything to win. But just those ties which every man may divide of his own free will are the most oppressive. They are unfelt, unseen, till suddenly they burn the wrists like fetters of fire, and the poor wretch who wears them has no power to help himself. James knew he had not strength for this fearless disregard of others. He dared not face the pain he would cause. He was acting like a fool. His kindness was only cowardly, but to be cruel required more courage than he possessed. If he went away, his anguish would never cease. His vivid imagination would keep before his mind's eyes the humiliation of Mary, the unhappiness of his people. He pictured the consternation and the horror when they discovered what he had done. At first, they would refuse to believe that he was capable of acting in so blackguardly a way. They would think it a joke, or that he was mad. And then the shame when they realized the truth. How could he make such a return for all the affection and the gentleness he had received? His father, whom he loved devotedly, would be utterly crushed. It would kill him muttered James. And then he thought of his poor mother, affectionate and kind, but capable of hating him if he acted contrary to her code of honour. Her immaculate virtue made her very hard. She accepted the highest from herself and demanded no less from others. James remembered in his boyhood how she punished his petty crimes by refusing to speak to him going about in cold and angry silence. He had never forgotten the icy indignation of her face when once she had caught him lying. Oh, these good people, how pitiless they can be. He would never have courage to confront the unknown dangers of a new life, unloved, unknown, unfriended. He was too merciful. His heart bled at the pain of others. He was constantly afraid of soiling his hands. It required a more unscrupulous man than he to cut all ties and push out into the world with no weapons but intelligence and a ruthless heart. Above all, he dreaded his remorse. He knew that he would brood over what he had done till it attained the proportions of a monomania. His conscience would never give him peace. So long as he lived, the claims of Mary would call to him and in the furthermost parts of the earth he would see her silent agony. James knew himself too well, and the only solution was that which, in a moment of passionate bitterness, had come thoughtlessly to his lips. I can always shoot myself. I hope you won't do anything silly, Mrs. Wallace had answered. It would be silly. After all, one has only one life, but sometimes one has to do silly things. The whim seized James to visit the Larchers, and one day he set out for Ashford, near which they lived. He was very modest about his attempt to save their boy, and told himself that such courage as it required was purely instinctive. He had gone back without realising in the list that there was any danger. Seeing young Larcher wounded and helpless, it had seemed the obvious thing to get him to a place of safety. In the heat of action, fellows were constantly doing reckless things. Everyone had a sort of idea that he, at least, would not be hit, and James, by no means oppressed with his own heroism, knew that courageous deeds without number were performed and passed unseen. It was a mere chance that the incident in which he took part was noticed. Again, he had from the beginning an absolute conviction that his interference was nothing less than disastrous. Probably the Boer sharpshooters would have let alone the wounded man, and afterwards their doctors would have picked him up and properly attended to him. James could not forget that it was in his very arms that Larcher had been killed, and he repeated, If I had minded my own business, he might have been alive to this day. 
it occurred to him also that with his experience he was much more useful than a callow ignorant boy so that to risk his more valuable life to save the others from the point of view of the general good was foolish rather than praiseworthy but it appealed to his sense of irony to receive the honour which he was so little conscious of deserving the larchers had been anxious to meet james and he was curious to know what they were like there was at the back of his mind also a desire to see how they conducted themselves whether they were still prostrate with grief or reconciled to the inevitable reggie had been an only son just as he was james sent no message but arrived unexpectedly and found that they lived some way from the station in a new red brick villa as he walked to the front door he saw people playing tennis at the side of the house he asked if mrs larcher was at home and being shown into the drawing-room the lady came to him from the tennis lawn he explained who he was of course i knew quite well she said i saw your portrait in the illustrated papers she shook hands cordially but james fancied she tried to conceal a slight look of annoyance he saw his visit was in opportune. We're having a little tennis party, she said. It seems a pity to waste the fine weather, doesn't it? A shout of laughter came from the lawn, and a number of voices were heard talking loudly. Mrs. Larcher glanced towards them uneasily. She felt that James would expect them to be deeply mourning for the dead son, and it was a little incongruous that on his first visit, they should find the whole family so boisterously gay. Shall we go out to them? said Mrs. Larcher. We're just going to have tea, and I'm sure you must be dying for some. If you didn't let us know you were coming, we should have sent to meet you. James had divined that if he came at a fixed hour, they would all have tuned their minds to a certain key, and he would see nothing of their natural state. They went to the lawn, and James was introduced to a pair of bosom, healthy-looking girls, panting a little after their violent exercise. They were dressed in white, in a rather masculine fashion, and the only sign of mourning was the black tie that each wore in a sailor's knot. They shook hands vigorously, it was a family trait, and then seemed at a loss for conversation. James, as was his way, did not help them and they plunged at last into a discussion about the weather and the dustiness of the road from Ashford to the house. Presently, a loose-limbed young man strode up and was presented to James. He appeared on friendly terms with the two girls who called him Bobbikins. "'How long have you been back?' he asked. "'I was out in the Imperial Yeomanry. Only I got fever and had to come home.' James stiffened himself a little, with the instinctive dislike of the regular of the volunteer. Oh, yes, do you go as a trooper? Yes, I'm pretty rapid was, I can tell you. He began to talk of his experience in a resonant voice, apparently well pleased with himself, while the red-faced girls looked at him admiringly. James wondered whether the youth intended to marry them both. The conversation was broken by the appearance of Mr. Larcher, a rosy-cheeked and bewhiskered man, dapper and suave. He had been picking flowers and handed a bouquet to one of his guests. James fancied he was a prosperous merchant who had retired and set up as a country gentleman. But if he was the least polished of the family, he was also the most simple. He greeted the visitor very heartily and offered to take him over his new conservatory. My husband takes everyone to the new conservatory, said Mrs. Larcher, laughing apologetically. It's the biggest run I thought, explained the worthy man. James, thinking he wished to talk of his son, consented. And as they walked away, Mr. Larcher pointed out his fruit trees, his pigeons. He was a fancier, said he, and attended to the birds entirely himself. Then, in the conservatory, made James admire his orchids and the luxuriance of his maiden hair. I suppose this sort of things grow in the open air at the Cape, he asked. I believe everything grows there. Of his son, he said absolutely nothing. And presently they rejoined the others. The Larchers were evidently estimable persons, healthy-minded and normal. 
but a little common. James asked himself why they had invited him if they wished to hear nothing of their boy's tragic death. Could they be so anxious to forget him that every reference was distasteful? He wondered how Reggie had managed to grow up so simple, frank and charming amid these surroundings. There was a certain pretentiousness about his people which caused them to escape complete vulgarity only by a hair's breadth. But they appeared anxious to make much of James, and in his absence had explained who he was to the remaining visitors, and these beheld him now with an awe which the hero found rather comic. Mrs. Larcher invited him to play tennis, and when he declined, seemed hardly to know what to do with him. Once, when her younger daughter laughed more loudly than usual at the very pointed chaff of the imperial yeoman, she slightly frowned at her, with a scarcely perceptible but significant glance in Jamie's direction. To her relief, however, the conversation became general, and James found himself talking with Miss Larcher of the cricket week at Canterbury. After all, he could not be surprised at the family's general happiness. Six months had passed since Reggie's death, and they could not remain in perpetual mourning. It was very natural that the living should forget the dead, otherwise life would be too horrible. And it was possibly only the larger's nature to laugh and to talk more loudly than most people. James saw that it was an united affectionate household, homely and kind, cursed with no particular depth of feeling and if they had not resigned themselves to the boy's death they were doing their best to forget that he had ever lived it was obviously the best thing and it would be cruel too cruel to expect people never to regain their cheerfulness i think i must be off said james after a while the trains run so awkwardly to tunbridge wells they made polite efforts to detain him but james fancied they were not sorry for him to go you must come and see us another day when we're alone said mrs larcher we want to have a long talk with you it's very kind of you to ask me he replied not committing himself mrs larcher accompanied him back to the drawing-room followed by her husband i thought you might like a photograph of reggie she said this was her first mention of the dead son and her voice neither shook nor had in it any unwonted expression i should like it very much it was on jamie's tongue to say how fond he had been of the boy and how he regretted his sad end but he restrained himself thinking if the wounds of grief were closed it was cruel and unnecessary to reopen them mrs larcher found the photograph and gave it to james her husband stood by saying nothing i think that's the best we have of him she shook hands and then evidently nerved herself to say something further we are very grateful to you captain parsons for what you did and we are glad to gave you the victoria cross i suppose you didn't bring it today inquired mr larcher i'm afraid not they showed him out of the front door mind you come and see us again but let us know beforehand if you possibly can Shortly afterwards, James received from the larchers a golden cigarette case, with a Victoria Cross and diamonds on one side and an inscription on the other. It was much too magnificent for use, evidently expensive, and not in very good taste. I wonder whether they take that as equal in value to their son, said James. Mary was rather dazzled. Isn't it beautiful? she cried. Of course, it's too valuable to use. What do you do to put in our drawing-room? Don't you think it should be kept under a glass case? Asked James, with his grave smile. You get so dirty if you leave it out, won't it? Replied Mary, seriously. I wish there were no inscription. It won't fetch so much we get hard up and have to pop our jewels. Oh, James! Cried Mary, shocked. You surely would do a thing like that? James was pleased to have seen the larchers. It satisfied and relieved him to know that human sorrow was not beyond human endurance. As the greatest of their gifts, the gods have vouchsafed to man a happy forgetfulness. In six months, the boy's family were able to give parties, to laugh and jest as if they had suffered no loss at all. And the thought of this cleared his way a little. 
if the worst came to the worst and the desperate step of which he had spoken seemed his only refuge he could take it with less apprehension pain to those he loved was inevitable but it would not last very long and his death would trouble them far less than his dishonour time was pressing and james still hesitated hoping distractedly for some unforeseen occurrence that would at least delay the marriage the house of death was dark and terrible and he could not walk rashly to his dreadful gates something would surely happen he wanted time to think time to see whether there was really no escape how horrible it was that one could know nothing for certain he was torn and rent by his indecision major forsyth had been put off by several duchesses and was driven to spend a few economical weekends at little frimpton he announced that since jamie's wedding was so near he would stay till it was over finding also that his nephew had not thought of a best man he offered himself he had acted as such many times at the most gentle functions and with a pleasant confusion of metaphor assured james that he knew the ropes right down to the ground three weeks to-day my boy he said heartily to james one morning on coming down to breakfast is it replied james getting excited wildly upon my word jamie you're the coolest lover i've ever seen why i've hardly known how to keep in some of the fellows i've been best man to i'm feeling a bit seedy to-day uncle william james thanked his stars that ill health was deemed sufficient excuse for all his moodiness mary spared him the rounds among her sick and needy whom notwithstanding the approaching event she would on no account neglect she told uncle william he was not to worry her lover but leave him quietly with his books, and no one interfered when he took long, solitary walks in the country. Jamie's reading now was a pretense. His brain was too confused. He was too harassed and uncertain to understand a word, and he spent his time face to face with the eternal problem, trying to see a way out, when before him was an impassable wall, still hoping blindly that something would happen, some catastrophe, which would finish at once all his perplexities and everything else besides. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of the Hero by W. Smith Mom. This LibraVox recording is in the public domain. In solitary walks, James had found his only consolation. He knew even in that populous district unfrequented parts where he could wander without fear of interruption. Among the trees and the flowers, in the broad meadows, he forgot himself. And, his senses sharpened by long absence, he learned for the first time the exquisite charm of English country. He loved the spring, with its yellow, countless buttercups, spread over the green fields like a cloth of gold whereon might fitly walk the angels of messa Perugino. the colours were so delicate that one could not believe it possible for paints and paint brush to reproduce them the atmosphere visibly surrounded things softening their outlines sometimes from a hill higher than the rest james looked down at a plain bathed in golden sunlight the fields of corn, the fields of clover, the roads and the rivulets formed themselves in that flood of light into an harmonious pattern, luminous and ethereal. A pleasant reverie filled his mind, unanalyzable, a waking dream of half voluptuous sensation. On the other side of the common, James knew a wood of tall fir trees, dark and ragged their sombre green veiled in a silvery mist as though like a chill vapour the hoar frost of a hundred winters still lingered among their branches at the edge of the hill up which they climbed in serried hundreds stood here and there an oak tree just bursting into leaf clothed with its new-born virtue like the bride of the young god spring and the everlasting youth of the oak tree contrasted wonderfully with the undying age of the firs then later in the height of the summer 
James found the pine wood cool and silent, fitting his humour. It was like the forest of life, the grey and sombre labyrinth where wandered the poet of hell and death. The tall trees rose straight and slender, like the barren masts of sailing ships, the gentle aromatic odour, the light subdued, the purple mist, so faint as to be scarcely discernible, a mere tinge of warmth in the day, all gave him an exquisite sound of rest. Here he could forget his trouble and give himself over to the love which seemed his real life. Here the recollection of Mrs. Wallace gained flesh and blood, seeming so real that he almost stretched out his arms to seize her. His footfall on the brown needles was noiseless, and the tread was soft and easy. The odours filled him like an eastern drug, with drowsy intoxication. But all that now was gone. When, unbidden, the well-known laugh rang again in his ears, for he felt on his hands the touch of slender fingers. James turned away with a gesture of distaste. Now Mrs. Wallace had brought him only bitterness, and he tortured himself insanely, trying to forget her. With tenfold forms, the sensation returned which had so terribly oppressed him before his illness. He felt that nature had become intolerably monotonous. The circumscribed, prim country was horrible. On every inch of it, the hand of man was apparent. It was a prison and his hands and feet were chained with heavy iron. The dark, immovable clouds were piled upon one another in giant masses, so distinct and sharply cut, so rounded, that one almost saw the impression of the fingers of some titanic sculptor. And they hung low down, overwhelming, so that James could scarcely breathe. The sombre aims were too well ordered, the meadows too carefully tended. All round, the hills were dark and drear, and that very fertility, that fat Kentish luxuriance, added to the oppression. It was a task impossible to escape from that iron circle. All power of flight abandoned him. Oh, he loathed it. The past centuries of people, living in a certain way, with certain standards, influenced by certain emotions were too strong for him james was like a foolish bird a bird born in a cage without power to attain its freedom his lust for a free life was futile he acknowledged with cruel self-contempt that he was weaker than a woman and effectual he could not lead the life of his little circle purposeless and untrue and yet he had not power to lead a life of his own. Uncertain, vacillating, torn between the old and the new, his reason led him. His conscience drew him back, but the ties of his birth and ancestry were too strong. He had not the energy even of the poor tram, who carries with him his whole fortune and leaves in the lap of the gods the uncertain future. James envied with all his heart the beggar boy, wandering homeless and penniless, but free. He, at least, had not these inhuman fetters which it was death to suffer and death to cast off. He, indeed, could make the world his servant. Freedom! Freedom! If one were only unconscious of captivity, what would it matter? It is the knowledge that kills and James walked again by the neat, iron railing which enclosed the fuse, his head aching with the rigidity and decorum, wishing vainly for just one piece of barren, unkept land to remind him that all the world was not a prison. Already the autumn had come. The rich, mouldering colours were like an air, melancholy with the approach of inevitable death. But in those passionate tints, in the red and gold of the apples, in the many tones of the first fallen leaves, 
there was still something which forbade one to forget that in the death and decay of nature there was always the beginning of other life yet to james the autumn heralded death with no consoling afterthought he had nothing to live for since he knew that mrs wallace could never love him his love for her had borne him up and sustained him but now it was hateful and despicable after all his life was his own to do what he liked with the love of others had no right to claim his self-respect if he had duties to them he had duties to himself also and more vehemently than ever james felt that such a union as was before him could only be a degradation he repeated with new emotion that marriage without love was prostitution if death was the only way in which he could keep clean that what he ignorantly despised why he was not afraid of death he had seen it too often for the thought to excite alarm it was but a common mechanical process quickly finished and not more painful than could be borne the flesh is all which is certainly immortal the dissolution of consciousness is the signal of new birth out of corruption springs fresh life like the roses from a roman tomb and the body one with the earth pursues the eternal round but one day james told himself impatiently that all these thoughts were mad and foolish he could only have them because he was still out of health life after all was the most precious thing in the world it was absurd to throw it away like a broken toy he rebelled against the fate which seemed forcing itself upon him he determined to make the effort and come what might break the hateful bonds it only required a little courage a little strength of mind if others suffered he had suffered too the sacrifice they demanded was too great but when he returned to primpton house the inevitability of it all forced itself once again upon him he shrugged his shoulders despairingly it was no good the whole atmosphere oppressed him so that he felt powerless some hidden influence surrounded james sucking from his blood as it were all manliness dulling his brain he became a mere puppet acting in, in accordance to principles that were not his own automatic willless his father sat as ever in the dining-room by the fire for only in the warmest weather would he do without artificial heat and he read the paper sometimes aloud making little comments his mother on the table on a stiff-backed chair was knitting everlastingly knitting outwardly there was in them a placid content and a gentleness which made them seem pliant as wax but really they were iron james knew at last how pitiless was their love how inhumanly cruel their intolerance and of the two his father seemed more implacable more horribly relentless his mother's anger was bearable but the colonel's very weakness was a deadly weapon his despair his dumb sorrow his entire dependence on the forbearance of others were more tyrannical than the most despotic power james was indeed a bird beating himself against the imprisoning cage and his bars were loving kindness and trust tears silent distress bitter dissolution and old age where's mary asked james she's in the garden walking with uncle william how will they get on together said the colonel smiling james looked at his father and thought he had never seen him so old and feeble his hands were almost transparent his thin white hair his bowed shoulders gave an impression of utter weakness are you very glad the wedding is so near father asked james placing his hand gently on the old man's shoulder i should think i was 
You want to get rid of me so badly? A man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We shall have to do without you. I wonder whether you are fond of Mary and of me. The colonel did not answer, but Mrs. Parsons laughed. My impression is that your father has grown so devoted to Mary that he hardly thinks you're worthy of her. Really? And yet you want me to marry her, don't you, Daddy? It's the wish of my heart. Were you very wretched when our engagement was broken off? Don't talk of it. Now it is all settled, Jamie. I can tell you that I'd sooner see you dead at my feet than that you should break your word to marry. James laughed. And you, mother? he asked lightly. She did not answer, but looked at him earnestly. What? You too? Would you rather see me dead and not married to Mary? What a bloodthirsty pair you are. James, laughing, spoke so gaily. It never dawned on them that his words meant more than was obvious. And yet, he felt that day, laughing but implacable, had signed his death warrant. With smiling faces, they had thrown open the portals of the house, and he, smiling, was ready to enter. Mary at that moment came in, followed by Uncle William. Well, James, there you are, she cried, in that hard, metallic voice which to James betrayed so obviously the meanness of her spirit and her self-complacency. Where on earth have you been? She stood by the table, strict, uncompromising, self-reliant, by her immaculate virtue, by the strength of her narrow will. She completely dominated the others. She felt herself capable of managing them all, and in fact had been giving Uncle William a friendly little lecture upon some action of which she disapproved. Mary had left off her summer things and wore again the plain serge skirt, and because it was rainy, the battered straw hat of the preceding winter. She was using up her old things, and having got all possible wear out of them, intended on the day before her marriage generously to distribute them among the poor. Is my face very red? she asked. There's a lot of wind today. To James, she had never seemed more unfeminine. That physical repulsion which at first had terrified him now was growing into an ungovernable hate. Everything Mary did irritated and exasperated him. He wondered if she did not see the hatred in his eyes as she looked at her, answering her question. No, no, he said to himself, I would rather shoot myself than marry you. His dislike was unreasonable, but he could not help it, and the devotion of his parents made him detest her all the more. He could not imagine what they saw in her. With hostile glance, he watched her movements as she took off her hat and arranged her hair, grimly drawn back and excessively neat. She fetched her knitting from Mrs. Parsons' work basket and sat down. All her actions had in them an insufferable air of patronage, and she seemed more than usually pleased with herself. James had an insane desire to hurt her, to ruffle that self-satisfaction, and he wanted to say something that should wound her to the quick. And all the time he laughed and jested as though he were in the highest spirits. And what were you doing this morning, Mary? asked Colonel Parsons. Oh, I biked into Tunbridge Wells with Mr. Dryland to play golf. He plays a rattling good game. Did he beat you? Well, no. She answered modestly. It so happened that I beat him, but he took his thrashing remarkably well. Some men get so angry when they are beaten by a girl. The curate has many virtues, said James. He was talking about you, Jamie. He said he thought you disliked him, but I told him of a certain you didn't. He's really such a good man, one can't help liking him. He said he'd like to teach you golf. And is he going to? Certainly not. I mean to do that myself. There are many things you want to teach him, Mary. You have your hands full. 
Oh, by the way, father told me to remind you and Uncle William that you were shooting with him the day after tomorrow. You'd fetch him at ten. I hadn't forgotten, replied James. Uncle William, we shall have to clean our guns tomorrow. James had come to a decision at last, and meant to waste no time. Indeed, there was none to waste, and to remind him how near was the date fixed for the wedding, were the preparations almost complete. One or two presents had already arrived. With all his heart, he thanked his father and mother for having made way easier for him. He thought what he was about to do the kindest thing both to them and to Mary. Under no circumstances could he marry her, that would be adding a greater lie to those which he had already been forced into, and the misery was more than he could bear. But his death was the only other way of satisfying their undoubted claims. He had little doubt that in six months he would be as well forgotten as poor Regulator, and he did not care. He was sick of the whole business and wanted the quiet of death. His love for Mrs. Wallace would never give him peace upon earth. It was utterly futile, and yet unconquerable. James saw his opportunity in Colonel Cliven's invitation to shoot. He was most anxious to make the affair seem accidental, and that in cleaning his gun was easy. He had been wounded before, and knew that the pain was not very great. He had, therefore, nothing to fear. Now at last he regained his spirits. He did not read or walk, but spent the day talking with his father. He wished the last impression he would leave to be as charming as possible, and took great pains to appear at his best. He slept well that night, and in the morning dressed himself with unusual care. At Primpton House they breakfasted at eight, and afterwards James smoked his pipe, reading the paper, he was a little astonished at his calm, but doubt no longer assailed him, and the indecision which paralysed all his faculties had disappeared. It is the beginning of my freedom, he thought. All human interests had abandoned him, except a vague sensation of amusement. He saw the humour of the comedy he was acting, and dispassionately approved himself, because he did not give way to histrionics. Well, Uncle William, he said at last, what do you say to setting to work on our guns? I'm always ready for everything, said Major Forsyth. Come on, then. They went into what they called the harness room, and James began carefully to clean his gun. I think I'll take my coat off, he said. I can work better without. The gun had not been used for several months, and James had a good deal to do. He leaned over and rubbed a little rust off the lock. Upon my word, said Uncle William, I've never seen anyone handle a gun so carelessly as you. Do you call yourself a soldier? I'm a bit slack, replied James, laughing. People are always telling me that. Well, take care, for goodness sake, it may be loaded. Oh no, there's no danger. It's not loaded, and besides it's locked. Still, you oughtn't to hold it like that. It would be rather comic if I killed myself accidentally. I wonder what Mary would say. Well, you've escaped death so often by the skin of your teeth. I think you're pretty safe from everything but old age. Presently, James turned to his uncle. I say, this is rotten oil. I wish you could get some fresh. I was just thinking that. Well, you are pal of the cook. Go and ask her for some. There's a good chap. She'll do anything for me, said Major Forsyth, with a self-satisfied smile. It was his opinion that no woman, conscious or scullery maid, could resist his fascinations, and taking the cup, he trotted off. James immediately went to the cupboard and took out a cartridge. He slipped it in, rested the butt on the ground, pointed the barrel to his heart and fired. End of chapter 22
Epilogue of the Hero by the Brismus at Moore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A letter from Mrs. Clibborn to General Sir Charles Clough, KCB 8, Glatton Terrace, Bath. Dear Charles, I am so glad to hear you are settled in your new house in Bath, and it is most kind to ask us down. I am devoted to Bath, one meets such nice people there, and all one's friends whom one knew centuries ago. It is such a comfort to see how fearfully old they are looking. I don't know whether we can manage to accept your kind invitation, but I must say I should be glad of a change after the truly awful things that have happened here. I have been dreadfully upset all the winter, and have had several touches of rheumatism, which is a thing I never suffered from before. I wrote and told you of the sudden and mysterious death of poor James Parsons, a fortnight before he was going to marry my dear Mary. He shot himself as gently while cleaning a gun, that is to say, everyone thinks it was an accident. But I am certain it was nothing of the kind. Ever since the dreadful thing happened, six months ago, it has been on my conscience. And I assure you that the whole time I have not slept a wink. My sufferings have been horrible. You will be surprised at the change in me. I am beginning to look like an old woman. I tell you this in strict confidence. I believe he committed suicide. He confessed that he loved me, Charles. Of course I told him I was old enough to be his mother, but his love is blind. When I think of the tragic end of poor Algie Turner, poisoned himself in India for my sick I don't know how I shall ever forgive myself. I never gave James the least encouragement, and when he said that he loved me, I was so taken aback and I nearly fainted. I am convinced that he shot himself rather than marry a woman he did not love. And what is more, my daughter, you can imagine my feelings. I have taken care not to breathe a word of this to Reginald, whose gout is making him more irritable every day, or to anyone else. So no one suspects the truth. But I shall never get over it. I could not bear to think of poor Algie Turner. And now I have on my head as well the blood of James Parsons. They were dear boys, both of them. I think I'm the only one who is really sorry for him. If it had been my son who was killed, I should either have gone raving mad or had hysterics for a week. But Mrs. Parsons merely said, The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I cannot help thinking it was rather profane and most unfeeling. I was dreadfully upset, and Mary had to sit up with me for several nights. I don't believe Mary really loved him. I hate to say anything against my own daughter, but I feel bound to tell the truth. And my private opinion is that she loved herself better. She loved her constancy and the good opinion of little Primpton. The fuss the Parsons have made of her, I'm sure, is very bad for anyone. It can't be good for a girl to be given way to so much. And I never really liked the Parsons. They are very good people, of course, but only infantry. I am happy to say that poor Jamie's death was almost instantaneous. When they found him, he said, it was an accident. I didn't know the gun was loaded. Most improbable, I think. It's wonderful how they've all been taken in, but then they didn't know his secret. A few minutes later, just before he died, he said, Tell Mary she's to marry the curate. If my betrothed had died, nothing would have induced me to marry anybody else. I would have remained an old maid, but so few people have any really nice feeling. Mr. Dryle and the curate had already proposed to marry, and she had refused him. He's a pleasant-spoken young man with a rather fine presence, not my idea at all, but that, of course, doesn't matter. Well, a month after the funeral, Mary told me that he had asked her again, and she had declined. I think it was very bad taste on his part, but Mary said she thought it most noble. It appears that Colonel and Mrs. Parsons both pressed her very much to accept a curate. They said it was Jamie's dying wish, and that his last thought had been for her happiness. There's no doubt that Mr. Dryland is an excellent young man, but if the Parsons had really loved their son, they would never have advised Mary to get married. I think it was most heartless. 
Well, a few days ago, Mr. Drelling came and told us that he had been appointed vicar of Stone Fairley in Kent. I went to see Mrs. Jackson, the wife of our vicar, and she looked it out in the clergy list. The stipend is three hundred pounds a year, and I am told that there is a good house. Of course, it's not very much, but better than nothing. This morning, Mr. Drelling called and asked for a private interview with Mary. He said he must, of course, leave Little Primpton and his vicarage would certainly want a mistress and finally for the third time begged her on his bended knees to marry him he had previously been to the parsons and the colonel sent for mary and told her that he hoped she would not refuse mr dryland for their sake and that they thought it was her duty to marry the result is that mary accepted him and is to be married very quietly by special license in a month the widow of the late incumbent of Stone Fairley moves out in six weeks, so this will give them time for a fortnight's honeymoon before settling down. They think of spending it in Paris. I think, on the whole, it is as good a match as poor Mary could expect to make. The stipend is paid by the ecclesiastical commissioners, which, of course, is much safer than Gleep. She is no longer a young girl, and I think it was her last chance although she is my own daughter i cannot help confessing that she is not the sort of girl that wears well she has always been plain no one would think she was my daughter and as time goes on she will grow plainer when i was eighteen my mother's maid used to say why miss there's many married women of thirty who would be proud to have your bust but our poor dear mary has no figure she will do excellently for the wife of a country vicar. She's so fond of giving people advice and of looking after the poor. And it won't matter that she's dowdy. She has no idea of dressing herself, although I've always done my best for her. Mr. Dryland is, of course, in the seventh heaven of delight. He has gone into Tunbridge Wells to get a ring, and as an engagement present has just sent round a complete edition of the works of Mr. Hall King. He's evidently generous. I think they will suit one another very well. And I'm glad to get my only daughter married. She was always rather a tie in Reginald and me. We are so devoted to one another that a third person has often seemed a little in the way. Also, you would not believe it. And we have been married for nearly thirty years. Nothing gives us more happiness than to sit holding one another's hands. I have always been sentimental, and I'm not ashamed to own it. Raggy is sometimes afraid that I shall get an attack on my rheumatism when we sit out together at night, but I always take care to wrap myself up well, and I invariably make him put a muffler on. Give my kindest regards to your wife, and tell her I hope to see her soon. Yours very sincerely, Clara de Tulville Clippen. End of epilogue. Recording by Lilith Brander. End of the hero. By W. Somerset Maugham.